Hi everyone, my name is Mary Krebs and today I'll be presenting on some research that I did in the Bowerman lab before I graduated. This project was led by Alyssa and she mentored me throughout it all. The project we worked on was titled Oocyte Meiotic Division, Cortical Stiffness versus Cortical Contractility. So first I'll start out with some background info. Female meiosis involves two asymmetrical divisions. So unlike in mitosis, where the chromosomes line up in the center of the cell and then divide evenly, in meiosis, the chromosomes migrate over to the cortex, where half of the chromosomes are extruded into a polar body in meiosis one, and then half of the sister chromatids are extruded into a second polar body in meiosis two. This results in an ovum with most of the cell's resources so that it is able to further develop in the future. The part that we were most interested in was meiosis one, because any errors in this process can lead to severe developmental defects. So like I mentioned earlier, in meiosis, the chromosomes, which are shown in magenta here, move to the plasma membrane shown in cyan. At this point, the contractile ring begins to assemble on the plasma membrane uh, nearest to the chromosomes. At the same time, we begin to see actomyosin patches pop up um, on the cortex, and they supposedly provide the contractile force that pulls this ring inward to capture one set of chromosomes and extrude a polar body. At the same time, we see these smaller furrows popping up throughout the cortex, and these smaller global furrows are what we studied for this project. But how can we look at this furrowing in vivo? In our lab, we use C. elegans, specifically the oocytes for this project. And these worms are great to work with because they are transparent. This allows us to fluorescently tag proteins that we want to see by a CRISPR to visualize different structures. So some structures that we'll be looking at are the plasma membrane, chromosomes, and microtubules. Once the worms are ready, we can then live image with the spin spinning disc confocal microscope. So here's a movie of a control oocyte expressing fluorescent markers for the plasma membrane and chromosomes. As you can see, the chromosomes migrate over to the cortex and that ring ingresses past one set of the chromosomes. Then it extrudes a polar body. At the same time, we see all of these other furrows that we're interested in around the cortex. There's a mutant that lacks the protein CLS2 that shows an increase in furrow length. And uh, I'm not talking about the main furrow here, but rather these global furrows. So we quantify data in two different ways. First, by taking the mean furrow length in microns over time and seconds after anaphase onset. Anaphase is when this furrowing occurs. So the control is shown in white here, the CLS2 mutant is shown in purple. And as you can see, there's a pretty significant difference in furrow length, the mutants exhibiting a pretty significant increase. We also look at the sum of the furrow lengths over time and seconds after anaphase onset. And similarly, we see an increase in furrow length there. But why is this so? Why do CLS2 mutants exhibit excessive furrowing? Um, so in some preliminary data, my mentor looked at um, oocytes expressing markers for microtubules and chromosomes and found that uh, in the control, you'll see the, these bright big patches of microtubules, whereas in the CLS2 mutant, you don't see any of those at all. So that data combined with the knowledge that CLS2 has tog-like domains that stabilize microtubules led us to hypothesize that cortical CLS2 patches stabilize cortical microtubules to counteract membrane aggression caused by actomyosin contractility during oocyte meiosis. That's a really big hypothesis that can be tested in many ways. But my role in the project was just to focus on a smaller part of that which is, do increased cortical microtubule levels suppress excessive membrane aggression in CLS2 mutants? And if it does, then that supports our hypothesis. To address this question, I used RNAi to knock down either CLIP7 or ZYG9, 
which are microtubule regulators in CLS2 mutants. By knocking these down, our goal was to increase the cortical microtubule levels and see how that would affect early. So once those worms are ready, we live image the oocytes with plasma membrane and chromosome markers and generated movies that we could quantify. Uh, we used convex hole quantification, which basically detects any defects in the hole, or in our case, any furrows in the cortex. And this con uh, quantification was done in collaboration with Adam Fries, and it allowed us to measure furrow length. So in the end, we found out that knocking down CLIP7 or ZYG9 does indeed reduce excessive furrowing in CLS2 mutants. So on the left here, I have some graphs showing the CLS2 CLIP7 double mutant in pink compared against the CLS2 uh, mutant. And as you can see, when you look at both the mean length and the sum of lengths, the double mutant shows a significant decrease in furrowing. We see the same thing when we look at the mean length of the CLS2 ZYG9 double mutant compared to the CLS2 mutant. But when we look at the sum of lengths, the difference between the two is actually not significant. And we think this is actually because there's a lot of furrows in the CLS2 ZYG9 double mutant, but they're much smaller. Um, but when you're adding up the furrow lengths, maybe it's actually comparable to the CLS2 mutant. Um, but even with that, we were able to conclude that increasing cortical microtubules re rescues furrowing, and that supports our hypothesis. So have some future directions. We wanted to get at what the mechanism was. So before I graduated, I started generating strains with different fluorescent markers that would allow us to see where the microtubules and mycin are relative to the furrows. I also started investigating other regulators upstream of CLS2 that may be involved in regulating membrane ingression. So here's a movie of an oocyte expressing markers for chromosomes and also for BUB1. Um, this is directly upstream of CLS2. So It'll be interesting to see how that compares with the microtubule patches and the CLS2 patches. But uh, this project is passed on to whoever's working on it next. Um, so with that, I'll finish up with my acknowledgments. Huge thanks to everyone in the Bowerman lab, um, especially Bruce and Alyssa, who taught me so much about how to conduct research, how to ask good questions, how to read papers. Um, and also thanks to Adam Fries for helping with the quantification. And lastly, I also want to thank the CURE's Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship um, helped fund uh, my research the summer of 2022. Uh, feel free to reach out to me over email with any questions, and thank you so much for listening.